Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to a new day, a new uh, week of sessions. Uh, let's begin this time with a word of prayer. Uh, maybe one of us could please lead us. Uh, Lubega, do you think you can lead us in prayer, please? Okay. Uh, anyone else? Uh, Paul, Anita, anyone can please lead us? Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we want to thank you for this morning. Lord, we humble ourselves before your presence as we continue to learn regarding the cross, the covenant. We pray, O oh God, that you would establish us in the covenant, Lord Jesus, and we pray that we would understand the meaning of what you have finished at the cross, Lord. We also submit by Paul to your hands, O oh God. We pray that you'd be able to deliver your message clearly to us, O oh God. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John. All right. Uh, so last week we did chapter five and we looked at chapter six as well. Uh, chapter five, we saw how it is important to speak uh, the covenant of God and keep it in your mouth always. Deuteronomy uh, is what we looked at. We looked at verses from there, how God told the people of Israel, a new generation has already passed. And they don't know what is happening. They don't even know what miracles that God did. And so God reminds Moses, tells them, tells Moses, write down everything that happened and tell them, let this word be in their mouth. And he gives the same uh, instruction to Joshua as well. Meditate on the word of God day and night and it will be well with you. And when we take the word of God in our mouth, it's like taking God's covenant in our mouth. And we looked at, how you know the, the the covenant is is a promise of God, right? So it's not it's not some you know fancy words. It's not some poetry that we are just reading and it sounds nice. It's it's got these good words that we can speak out. No, God's covenant is God's promise, right? So in every season, in every situation that we are going through, we can stand on this promise, we can stand on the covenant that God has given us, right? And then we also looked at something very important, which is God has given us the covenant, but he's given us the choice also. Deuteronomy 13, 19, uh, he talks about how, uh, you know, there's life and blessings, there's death and curses. Uh, remember, we saw the example of Joshua. Uh, they enter the promised land and he tells the people of Israel, now, you got a choice. You can choose to worship the gods of the Canaanites, the Egyptian gods, or you can choose the God of Israel. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So in everything, God has, you know, uh, put the buffet out, so to speak. Right? He's the buffet is out. It is our choice to pick. The covenant to pick the blessings of God, and so when there will be times when you know uh, there will be ups and downs, right? Does not mean that God is you know not uh, you know not keeping His side of the covenant, or does not mean that we are not in the covenant. No, life and blessings, death and curses. It's a choice that we have. Right? God is not going to enforce it. Uh, even when we read later on. And, uh, you know, and through the scriptures and judges. Remember, God said, you don't need a king. But the people of Israel said, "You, we need a king. So what did God say? Okay. You know, he gave the choice to them. He said, okay, you, you want a king? Okay. And then King Saul was appointed king. And then later on, we see the kings came, many other kings came. So uh, it's a choice that you and I have. And it's good that we have chosen uh, to be in the Lord's side, right? Uh, then we saw that we need to believe the word, confess the word, and live by the word. Book of James, uh, James is writing and he says, if somebody hears the word, he does not and does not do it. It's like going in front of the mirror, looking at your face, 
and forgetting how we look. Yes, we believe the word. Yes, we confess the word. But if we don't live by the word, then it just becomes, you know, fancy jargons and, you know, uh, it, it will not bear fruit in our lives. So all of this go hand in hand. We can't say, okay, no, I'll only live by the word. I won't believe and I won't confess. Or we can't say, I'll only confess, but I won't believe and live. Uh, it all goes together. We believe, we confess, and we live by the word. And that's when we'll see uh, God's covenant really working powerfully in us. We looked at chapter 6 as well, uh, how God established the new covenant. Now, the old covenant, we saw the blood covenants. We saw the covenants that God set up uh, and how he faithfully kept his promises. And in the new covenant was new promises. God himself became the covenant sacrifice. The Lord Jesus shed his blood. He uh, gave his body. And now we are partakers of this covenant. And very importantly, the Lord Jesus is now our high priest. He is our mediator. Remember in the Old Testament, the people would go, the people of Israel, they would sacrifice the lamb, they would take the blood, they would go to the high priest, and the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and offer that sacrifice. But now when Jesus was on the cross, the veil was torn from top to bottom, signifying what? There's no more separation between man and God. Sin has been dealt with. And so Jesus is now our mediator. He is our high priest. He is making intercession for us in heaven. And so all of us, uh, we are wrapped in this blood covenant. Now, the safest place to be is to be in the presence of God, the will of God. Uh, and what a better covenant, what better promises uh, the Lord Jesus has given us. Uh, no more of any sacrifices, no more of, you know, uh, going and, uh, you know, uncertainty. The people were uncertain. We look at Hebrews later on today as well. The people were uncertain. Even though they did the offering, they cut the lamb, they gave the blood, all of it, there was uncertainty. They, 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 didn't, they didn't experience salvation. They didn't experience uh, uh, the washing of sins. There was uncertainty. But here in this new covenant, there's certainty. We know we have a new identity. We know uh, that that you know our sins are washed away, and so we looked at how the Lord Jesus instituted and ratified the new covenant. Now we'll move on to chapter seven, which is the seal and the sign of the new covenant. Now, the seal of the old covenant and sign was you know circumcision. I uh, said, okay, uh, Abraham circumcise the people and that will be your seal and and that will be a sign to the people that you are part of the abrahamic covenant now what is the seal and the sign of the new covenant so we look at that in this chapter before we go ahead uh, anybody would like to uh, share your thoughts any questions you have uh, from what we have studied up to now uh, any questions Shall we go ahead with chapter 7? Everything okay? Well, can you please uh, tell us who, what is the seal of the new covenant? You, you already told us the seal of the old covenant. Yes, yes. We're, we're getting into this chapter, uh, Isaac. We're, that's the chapter we're going to start now. The seal and the sign of the new covenant, which is chapter 7. Okay, thank you, sir. Oh, yes, you're welcome. Right. Any other questions? Any thoughts? Shall we move ahead? Yes, Pastor. Okay, great. All right. Okay, the seal and the sign of the new covenant. Now, let's like as, as I said, the seal of the old covenant was circumcision. The seal and the sign of a new covenant is a, a, a circumcision of the heart, new birth and circumcision of the heart, right? Uh, when I say new birth, 
Second Corinthians. We're going to read a couple of scriptures now. Uh, Second Corinthians five seventeen. Let's let's uh, maybe one of us can please read that. No, it's a common verse. Second um, Corinthians five seventeen. Go ahead. Anyone? Please read Second Corinthians five seventeen. Therefore, if anyone is in crisis, a new creation, all things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Zeli. Here it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Now, there is there are two important, uh, you know, points I would take like to take from this verse. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Now, picture this in the old covenant. Only the Jews would be allowed to go and make a sacrifice. No Gentile is going to, you know, even think about doing it. Firstly, it was not, the God of Israel was not something they believed in. And secondly, even if they believed, they were not allowed to do it, right? Uh, they were not allowed to, okay, uh, even if they believe in the God of Israel, they were not allowed to come and do the sacrifices. But here in the new covenant, Right. Uh, you, you remember what happened uh, even even when we see the Lord Jesus and then uh, the Apostle Paul in his ministry, how the Jews were against him. Why? Because he was baptizing the Gentiles. And for them, it was like, no, 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 no Gentiles. You know, we are Jews. God has chosen only us. It was only after about 25 years. Uh, I'm sorry, I think it's 15 years. Yes, it's 15 years. The Lord Jesus died. 15 years later is when, you know, the the whole uh, 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 Acts 15 happened where, you know, they decided, okay, it's all right to even uh, baptize the, uh, the Gentiles. Why was it such a, uh, you know, contention at that time? Because they believe the Messiah has come only for the Jews. Now, in the old covenant, it was only Jews. But in the new covenant, if anyone is in Christ. The word anyone. You can be a Jew, you can be a Roman, you could be a, a Greek, you could be anyone. You could be a, a rich person, a poor person, anyone. The word anyone includes anyone, everyone around us. Poor, rich, uh, you know, uh, uh, uneducated, educated, anyone is in Christ. He is a new creation, a new birth, right? So the first seal of the new covenant is a new birth. Romans 8.29, let's, let's read that. Romans, sorry, Romans 2.29. Romans chapter 2 and verse 29. Romans chapter two verses twenty nine. No, a man is a no, a man is a Jew if he is he is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a man's praise is not from men but from God. Amen. Thank you, said. So Paul is writing to the Romans here. He's saying it doesn't matter if you are a Jew. But he, if you go to the previous verse, he's saying, even if you're a Jew, it doesn't really matter. But, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly and, this, and circumcision is that of the heart. Now, if a Jew is listening to this, he'll say, how can circumcision be of the heart? Because circumcision is a physical act. Right? And here, Paul is writing to the Romans under the new covenant and he's saying circumcision is not a physical act only, but circumcision of the heart that is not in the letter, but of the spirit and whose praise is not from men, but is from God. You know, in the old covenant, if you're circumcised, there's praise from people. People say, oh, I'm circumcised. I, I'm a part of the covenant. Right? What do they do when a child reaches... Uh, about eight odd years old, the first thing we go to circumcise the child. Ah, oh, he's circumcised. Right? Uh, so it was a great thing. It was a great festival. 
uh, you know, the rich uh, of the in, in the Old uh, Testament, the rich people, the wealthy people would cut a dove, they would cut a lamb, they would have a feast for many days on the day of circumcision of any of their family members. Now, Paul is writing and saying it is not just an outwardly, uh, you know, uh, expression, but here it is the circumcision of the heart, the spirit, not of the letter, but something that not just because men will praise you because you're circumcised, but we, we, uh, we are circumcised in the heart because God is pleased with that. And then he says, this new birth in Galatians 5, 6, again, he writes, For in Christ, neither circumcision nor circumcision avails anything but faith working through love. What an amazing letter of Galatians. Paul has gone there on his first missionary journey. He's toiled really hard. He's gone to Galatia. In Galatia, there are five churches. And then he preaches and he plants churches there, Iconium, Lystra, Derby. Um, uh, uh, Antioch of Pisidia, he, he plants these churches and he moves on from there. And as he's coming back, he, he comes back, he visits the churches and he sees what's happening. So he goes back to Jerusalem and then he sits and he writes this letter and he says, who has come in between? And when we have preached the gospel, we have told you that the message that we have shared was not circumcision. The message we shared was that Jesus Christ did everything. And we are, uh, you know, we are part of this new covenant. We have been set free. And the, the gospel is about Jesus Christ. Now, some people have come in between and said, you have to be circumcised and you have got circumcised. And Paul is, you know, bringing context here. He's saying, for in Christ Jesus... Whether you are circumcised or not circumcised, it doesn't really matter. But what matters is faith working through love. And how is faith working through love? It's a new birth inside us. You know, when we were not in Christ, we may not be, you know, walking in faith. We may not be walking in love. We may not be walking in the gifts of the Spirit. But after this new birth, this new circumcision, it is not, it is not, you know, uh, 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 circumcision or uncircumcision that matters in Christ Jesus, but faith working through love. And so we must understand that the reason Paul was persecuted, the reason why he was so oppressed by people around him was because he was talking practically, but he was also talking in the spiritual, trying to make them understand that it is not like, you know, because you're circumcised, Jesus is going to say, oh, please, uh, you know, you can come in, you're accepted. No. Paul is trying to say, you don't have to be circumcised. Was Paul circumcised? Definitely he was. Paul knew he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He knew everything. He probably followed the law more than anyone else. But here he's writing, don't worry about the old covenant. Yes, it's wonderful. The promises are wonderful. But you don't need to keep that because God has given a new covenant. So there's no point of circumcision. Instead of that, circumcise your heart. Make sure that your heart is right. Walk in faith. Walk in love. That is what pleases God. Colossians 2, verse 11 and 12. Yes, could one of us please read that? Colossians chapter 2. 11 and 12. Colossians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. In him you were also circumcised in, in the putting of the sinful nature, not with the circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. Amen. Thank you, Sid. Uh, so here, Paul is again writing to the Colossians. He's saying, in him, which is in Jesus Christ, 
you were not circumcised by hands it was not a physical act you didn't you, you know you, you don't you didn't go to the high priest and uh, it was not a physical act done but in him it is you're putting off the sins of the flesh and when you do that you are you're being your circumcision by christ right uh, which means so for example if i'm living a life of sin right uh, and I put that away and I say, God, please forgive me. Uh, help me to walk in holiness. Help me to understand what you've done for me on the cross. And I accept that and I walk in forgiveness and then I walk in holiness. What am I doing? It is even greater than being you know, just circumcised in the physical. But what I'm doing is when I'm putting away the sins of the flesh, when I'm putting away the things that take me away from God, uh, it is called the circumcision of the heart, circumcision by Christ. In the same letter, Paul writes, uh, a few chapters later, he, he, he explains, he says, put off these aspects, anger, jealousy, pride, hatred, put it off, put on love, gentleness, humility, kindness, faithfulness, patience, endurance. And so, our hearts are circumcised, and that is the seal, and we are marked with the Holy Spirit. You know, in the Old Covenant, the, the, the seal of circumcision was done, and it was also a mark, right? Uh, uh, there was a physical mark that was left. And so in, in, in the New Covenant, when we are circumcised in our heart, the seal of the mark is the Holy Spirit. God puts the Holy Spirit in us, and that is a mark. That's why Paul also writes later on, he says, uh, you was, do not grieve the Holy Spirit with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Right? Whom you were sealed, whom you were marked for in the day of redemption. Let's read Ephesians chapter 1, 13 and 14. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. And you are also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, have, having believed you were marked in him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Amen. Thank you, Sid. What a wonderful verse. We were, uh, we were marked with the seal, the promise of the Holy Spirit, through whom we have inheritance in Christ Jesus. So the Holy Spirit is our, is our mark, is our seal, and through whom we have the inheritance that God has for us. Remember what uh, God told Abraham? You will have an inheritance. You will you will have uh, uh, an inheritance that will go on from generation to generation to generation. And this is my sign that uh, I mean, this is my seal. This is going to be, uh, uh, you know, circumcision. And now, the Holy Spirit is granting us a promise. It's a promise of the Holy Spirit, granting us an inheritance not earthly but an inheritance that is eternal, right? What does the Holy Spirit do inside us? You know, it, he, he rebukes us, he corrects us, he disciplines us, he strengthens us, he, he does so much inside us. Why is he there? Because it's the promise of the, it's a promise which God has given. It is a seal. And so when we uh, think that, you know, the Holy Spirit is our seal, you don't want to get rid of that seal, right? Because he, that seal is our inheritance. And say we say, God, uh, you know, through every season we say, Lord, I thank you. That is why it's so important as believers to pray in the Holy Spirit. He's our seal. He's there. Uh, and so uh, we can, you know, we can always look to the Holy Spirit. And how much greater is this new covenant? 
picture what happened in the old covenant the holy spirit would come you know anoint people and speak through the prophets and he would go back but now he's a seed he's there every time always and he's an inheritance for us uh in in the covenant in this new covenant uh, hi joy uh, joy the, we are on page 33 on the notes yeah thank you yeah welcome uh okay so let's go to the sign Right now, we saw that the seal is the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, uh, like in the old covenant, the seal was circumcision. Here is, uh, you know, the circumcision of the heart, new birth. And now let's go to the sign. The sign is the Lord's table. The Lord's table, which is what we celebrate on Sundays, and oh, you know, we can do it any time. Uh, the Lord's table is a sign. Of the new covenant right uh, the meaning of the lord's table uh, genesis 13 has a wonderful uh, illustration uh, which points to the lord's table you know, uh, melchizedek uh, the high priest uh, presented bread and wine to abraham right if you read genesis 13 you, you will see that uh, and then what did jesus do he instituted uh, with the Lord's table, he instituted this new covenant as a sign. What did he say before he, before in the Lord's table, he said, this is my body, which is given up. It's going to be a sign, right? Uh, you know, for example, you see these weather forecasts, you know, the weather news. See, they, they, they look at signs and they say, okay, it looks like there's going to be uh, a, a hot, very hot day or looks like there's going to be some fierce winds or looks like there's going to be uh, you know some floods in certain areas or you know they, they weather forecast they look at signs and they and they uh, you know share what is going to happen or they predict things ahead but the lord jesus didn't predict right the lord's table was a confirmation of what was going to happen right what did he say Eat my flesh and drink my blood. Let's read John chapter 6, 53 to 56. John 6, 53 to 56. Go ahead. Any one of us? Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Unless you eat the flesh on the, of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my, and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Amen. Thank you, Joy. So we see here that in the new covenant, the Lord Jesus is saying, eat my flesh and drink my blood. Now, it may sound, uh, I'm sure the disciples were wondering, well, what is happening? Well, what, what is he saying? But Jesus interjects his, you know, I am the bread of life in John 6, 48 with the blood covenant. And he says, you eat my flesh and you drink my blood. Now, eating the flesh of a sacrifice was okay. Drinking of the blood was prohibited in the old covenant. But the blood covenant, what does it do? It satisfies hunger uh, and quenches thirst. In, in other words, the blood covenant, like we studied earlier on, it, it, it satisfies uh, every need of the other person. Should be willing to give all that you have for the other person now in the new covenant the lord jesus on the last supper he says do this eat my flesh and drink my blood and he verse 56 he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and i in him and so the sign that we will we are in the new covenant is partaking in the Lord's table. The Lord's table is a powerful act that we we you know that we do. 
together as a community. Paul himself, while writing to the Corinthians, he says, yes, we come together, but we don't come together to, uh, you know, take, partake in the Lord's Supper to fulfill, uh, you know, to fill our stomachs and to feel all right. Because the Lord's Supper is not something that is taken lightly. Uh, Paul writes and he says, if, 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 if you don't have, if, you know, don't you have food at home to eat? Don't you have things to drink at home? Why is it that you bring contempt upon yourself by coming into church and eating and drinking of the Lord's table in an unworthy manner? And by doing so, some of them have invited sickness and wrath upon themselves. Why was it? Why was Paul so uh, strict on that matter? Why was he so? Why was he, uh, you know, rebuking the church? Because now they they knew they were speaking in tongues. There was prophecy, word of knowledge. They knew everything, right? The Cor Corinthian church was flowing in the gifts of the Spirit, but they forgot that this new covenant, this partaking of the Lord's table, is the sign, is a powerful act. Of the same way in the old covenant, how uh, you know uh, God ratified uh, you know the the old covenant through Abraham and through Moses, the blood covenant, this new covenant, symbolic of you know of how the of the washing away the blood will wash away the sins, the body will bring healing upon us, and so Paul was very uh, you know very he was making sure that. The congregation in Corinth knew what 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 it was to partake in the Lord's table. The purpose of the covenant is relationship, coming to a place of abiding in Him. Right when we say, "Lord, I believe," see, it's not about uh, you know the the bread and the wine. It's not about you know what we have. Right, we can have a piece of biscuit or even water. It's not about the physical element, but it's about understanding what this blood and this body did. And when we understand and receive that power, that revelation, it, that whatever we are having, when we partake, it becomes the resurrection power of Christ. I'm sure we've, we've been doing this for many, many years on Sundays. There are times when... You know, I, I remember share this example. Uh, it happened to me many, many years ago. Uh, after I accepted the Lord Jesus, uh, you know, I, I went to church, and you know, I was still living in casual sin. Right? Uh, still, you know, every now and then there was sin involved. And so this one day I went to church. I was probably about twenty-two. Uh, went to church. And, you know, they were serving the Lord's Supper. And I thought to myself, I don't want to partake of this uh, because uh, I'm still sinful. I didn't understand, right? Uh, I said, I, I'm still living continual sin. How can I partake of this? Uh, and so I was very sad that morning and I, I and I didn't partake in the Lord's table, right? Uh, and and I, of course, I genuinely prayed and I said, God, help me in this area to overcome this sin. Uh, I want to overcome, but I'm not able to. And uh, and so it was very sad. And uh, uh, But I went home after that. And uh, I remember, you know, I, I just well, had some, you know, something to drink. My, you know, my mom gave me some tea and a, a piece of bread. And she said, why don't you have some breakfast? Because it was late. So when she gave it to me, uh, immediately the Holy Spirit, that day, reminded me of something and it was as if I was sitting in that place I will never forget that picture sitting in that place and I felt the power of the Holy Spirit in such a strong way uh, you know my hands are all shaking it was, it was just it was not something which was you know uh, not just some emotional thing that happened to me but it was a physical uh, I, I could sense the power of the Holy Spirit just inside me and I felt the Holy Spirit saying, let's partake in the Lord's table together. It was like as if, you know, uh, uh, the Holy Spirit was comforting me saying, you are worthy to partake of this. 
uh, you didn't partake in the you know in the church but uh, uh, i felt like the holy spirit was saying you are worthy to partake and i remember that day just saying god i i accept this bread i think i i believe this is your body and uh, and and the tea it was just a cup of tea and i said this is your blood wash me from my sins help me never to go back to th- to that sin again from that day after i partook i i i recognized the power of the holy spirit inside and i recognized that god has done something in me from that day to now it's probably about 15 years now oh no, not 15 10 years now 12 years now and i've never gone back to that that is the power of the new covenant when we partake in the lord's table in a manner that we understand what jesus did on the cross it brings revelation we are partakers of this new covenant what do, what it does is it brings us into an intimate relationship with god not just a relationship you know we have friends right we have friends we are in a relationship with them then we have parents we are in an intimate relationship with them this closer right and the blood covenant this partaking in the lord's table brings us into uh, an intimate relationship with the lord jesus christ right uh, so maybe some of us are feeling why am i living uh, this life of sin maybe we may feel uh, you know every time i stand up and then i fall again and i'm uh, maybe there's some weakness that the enemy is trying to just you know bring you down uh, it happens to everyone don't be discouraged because uh remember we are partakers of the new covenant the enemy's work is to accuse us but he accuses he's the accuser of the brother and he says you are not worthy you cannot do this you are how can you partake of this how can you be part of god's kingdom when you are walking in sin you are walking in this life of continual uh betrayal and ag- anger and denial and uh the enemy accuses but i want to encourage you remember that you are in the new covenant when you partake in the lord's table his power his resurrection power his presence the sign the the seal of the holy spirit is there inside us he begins to minister to us and so he's able to change things for us so uh, so uh, that's the importance of the new covenant this was not there in the old covenant i love what apostle paul says as uh, as many times as you do it do it in remembrance of me you don't have to wait for a sunday you don't have to wait for the pastor to come and pray for you you don't have to wait for all of that as a believer you are in covenant with god there are times i've just you know in my weakest stage my weakest times i've just gone taken a few few whatever is there bread maybe a piece of bread some water prayed believing that this is the you know the the body and the blood of Christ had it and i felt the presence of god comforting and strengthening me paul says as many times as you do it do it in remembrance of me so i encourage you even as you do it don't do it like just because i want to do it and my problems will go away no do it uh, uh with this uh, reverence that the lord jesus paid the price for me and i'm part of this new covenant because i remember one of my one of this church uh, youth came up to me and he said pastor uh, i went through a very difficult problem and i'm right now currently going through a very difficult problem situation and i don't know what's going to happen so i took the lord's supper uh, and i waited two days the problem didn't subside so i said okay the lord's supper is not a medicine or it's not a, a you know a, a thing that we take just to avoid problems you know so sometimes we need to ex- we need to understand as leaders and pastors we need to teach this to our congregation that it's not just some ritual that we do to avoid uh, you know uh, evil spirits from attacking no it is it is 
an eternal righteous act that we are doing and so um, we end with this chapter we'll go to chapter 8 we have 10 minutes and we take a break we'll go to chapter 8 before that uh, any thoughts on this uh, any questions uh, that you have anyone would like to share your experience maybe after taking the Lord's Supper you've experienced healing or deliverance anyone would like to share just to bless each one of us Yeah, Paul, can you hear me? Yeah, sure. Go ahead, Nikki. I, I just wanted to like re I mean, just reiterate what you said. In our church, there have been quite a few people who yeah. given up uh, alcoholism and many things uh, with baptism and uh, the communion. Also, there are a lot of people whose lives have just been transformed through this. So, I definitely, I just wanted to say it as an encouragement to others. That, uh, I definitely agree with what you say, and we've seen lives change. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nikki. Yeah. Uh, anyone else would like to share uh, maybe your personal experience too? Uh, how the Lord's table has maybe blessed you, or a friend, or people in your church? Yeah. I just I want to just ask you a question. Go ahead, Azri. Okay. I think connection or in relation to this Lord's table. Uh, in certain denominations, they serve the wine and act it's actual wine. But in certain domination, denomination actually yeah, frown against drinking wine in any other capacity. Yeah. Uh, how can we reconcile this in, in, in relation to our own faith or that we profess? Because certain denomination actually they serve the, the, the Lord's table with wine. Mm. Yeah, that's that's a very good question, Isaac. Yes. Uh, so uh, certain denominations, yes, do give the regular wine, and certain de denominations just give grape juice, uh, diluted grape juice. Now, um, I would say this: uh, there would be different schools of thoughts on this, but uh, this is just my understanding, and uh, uh, you can feel free to, you know, ask others as well, uh, you know, read up on this. But here's what I understand from: now, as we did study, uh, it it can be water, it can be wine, it can be juice, it can be anything. Uh, but I do get where you're coming from, Isaac, that the Bible, uh, you know, teaches us that we should stay away from wine and. Uh, now, in in during the times, during older times, uh, you know, uh, wine was definitely used as medicine for Paul writes to, uh, and he says, uh, drink a little wine to, uh, you know, to make your stomach better. He was going through a sickness. And so people use that as an advantage to drink wine. But there are plenty of other verses that teach us that, you know, uh, now the word wine uh, includes alcohol, uh, intoxicating drinks, right? Uh, uh, so we need to be, uh, you know, be aware that, you know, it's not only like the grape juice or the grape wine that comes from uh, the wine press, but uh, it, it, when, when we say wine, it could be all these other intoxicating drinks also in world. But uh, what I would say is, if it is something that is, very little that can, you know, just to, uh, it does not intoxicate you, right? We don't take the wine to get intoxicated. That is why Paul writes to the Corinthians and he says, don't eat and drink like it's, it's you know, it's food and uh, uh, water or it's food and some drinks to fill your stomach. Don't do that. So Isaac, if we look at it, more than looking at it as, okay, this is wine, this is a little bit of wine, look at the elements as the power of God resting upon it when we understand it. Right? Now, we cannot stop a denomination from saying, don't take, you know, it's just, you know, they, they can say, you know, just a little bit, it's to, it's, we are honoring the Lord, we are remembering what the Lord did for us. So I think we cannot stop them but more than the element itself, it is the power of God that is working through that. Right? So as a leader, Isaac, what I would suggest to you is leave it as it is. 
right? Leave it as it is. What you can do is if, if you're going to a church and if your church is giving you uh, probably wine uh, with, just say, have it, but have it in, uh, you know, in uh, knowing that, you know, it's the blood of Christ. Now, the moment we think, okay, it's wine, it's wine, and our mind goes there, we've lost the, you know, the whole aspect of doing, partaking in the Lord's table. You think, okay, oh, it's wine, it's wine. Why are they giving wine? Or why are they doing this? And so the whole, you know, uh, reason for partaking in the Lord's table is lost. It just becomes a ritual. So there are certain denominations which have different essence, right? And so here's what I would leave it at. It does not change the value or the power of uh, the Lord's table. Certain places, people remove their footwear, get into church. Certain churches, people don't remove their footwear. But is the Holy Spirit there in both places? Yes. Is the power of God still there to manifest and work miracles, bring healings? Yes. So these aspects, uh, you know, should not become a major, right? Meaning we should not keep that as a priority. Or we should not keep thinking about that and saying, okay, because of this, you know, uh, what we are doing is wrong. No. There are some places women cover their hair. Some places they don't. Uh, but is the Holy Spirit, is the Lord Jesus still ministering to them? Yes. Right. So more than these physical, uh, you know, uh, things involved, it is the spiritual that matters. So Isaac, I've, uh, what I would say is, there would be different denominations with different, uh, you know, practices. Uh, but as long as you're, that practice is done in reverence, in holiness, remembering the Lord Jesus for his sacrifice, I think it would be all right. Uh, but just let it go. And whatever they give, just think of it as uh, the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. I hope that answers your question, Isaac. Yes, Pastor, perfectly said. Yeah, right. it's, it's the spirit and the essence of the whole ritual that is yeah. important. Yeah. Of course, in my church, we don't serve uh, wine. We serve uh, fruit juice. But yeah. I mean, we, 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 are not, we are not judging. It's the, the command and the essence of the thing. So it's yes. well answered, Pastor. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Isaac. Yeah. Uh, all right, we have two minutes more. We'll, we'll take a break. We'll come back at 11. And we will uh, continue with our class.